Hey, this is Troy from Planet 76. We've got some really good Sixers focused content coming your way today. Make sure you subscribe to the pod so you can be in the know when we release new content. Enjoy the show. What is going on, Planet 76? Troy here. Got Michael with me as always. Episode 62 of the podcast, August 18th, recording episode 62, and um, some pretty cool news. Um, The NBA season is only two months away, two months from today. How does that make you feel, Michael? Good. Very good. Very good. (laughs) Yeah, it's time for some. Uh, it's time for basketball, man. I, I, I don't think you're the. You're not the biggest football guy. I'm not the biggest football guy. I'm ready for basketball. <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, I mean, it's it's about that time where you're like, okay, I really want the NBA to come back, you know. So. For sure, for sure. So, uh, a little bit about what we're gonna get into today. Um, so the schedule released was released yesterday for the Sixers, and so we'll break that down a little bit. Uh, everybody always likes to look at the schedule and see uh, some key matchups, some key games, see if your team gets a Christmas Day game, which the Sixers do for the first time since 2019, yeah. I think. Um, so last two seasons without a Christmas Day game. but Or, or I'm sorry, yeah, last two. And then um, talk about some Kevin Durant stuff. That just continues to – rumors continue to uh, go around on him. And so we'll briefly, briefly Very probably briefly, mention yes. him. <laughs> And then uh, as we did on episode 61, we talked about a couple of the Sixers newcomers and just kind of did a uh, what we called a player profile on them. And um, I think you guys enjoyed it. And so I hope you guys enjoyed it because we got a couple more coming your way. We're going to talk about P.J. Tucker, George Niang, and Matisse Thibel, cool. um on this episode just to give a little talk about them and how they fit into this Sixers team. So, um, yeah, let's get into the schedule first. So um, what... What caught your attention? Where do you want to go with that? Well, for starters, the one thing that really caught my attention was Rivals Week. The NBA introduced this new thing called Rivals Week where pretty self-explanatory, but they're going to have a slate of games for a week where it's basically teams who are pretty well-known for playing great games against Mm -hmm. each other, having legitimate rivalries, or whatever the case may be, getting games against each other. And the Sixers are actually among a few teams, not many, that have two games during Rivals Week. One against the Nuggets, one against the Nets. So I'm really, really excited. Obviously Christmas Day, too. But I'm really, really excited right. to see those matchups. Obviously Sixers-Nets, obvious reasons. Never Can never get too much of that. But also Embiid-Jokic. <laughs> I think any extra Embiid-Jokic matchups that we get to see is a plus because... We don't get to see a lot of them, and when we do, lately, there's been issues. Whenever it was in right. 2020, there was COVID. 2021, this past year in November, well, last year in November, Embiid was out. 2022, that was the only one we've gotten really to see in the past. Yeah. One of the few we've gotten to see in the past few years. So to see more than one, I think there might be three on the slate, is fantastic. I'm very much looking forward to that. <coughs> Yeah, that is an excellent point. So rivalry week, and um, yeah, it goes without saying with the Nets and certainly with Embiid, Jokic as well. So that's that's what caught your eye. What caught my eye are a couple things. So um, obviously the first couple games of the season are like must-see, like ones yeah. you're really, really excited to see, and so they're going to help the year get going, I think, just for you know Philadelphia fans, myself included, just to be really, really excited for the start of the season. So we kick off the year. In Boston, October 18th, again, two months from today. And then the home opener is two days later, hosting Giannis and the Milwaukee Bucks. So um, we start off the year against the the top of the Eastern Conference. Um, That's for sure. And so uh, we'll see how things go. I mean, obviously, we're not going to, you know, we go 0-2 in those games. We're not going (laughs) to say the year's a failure, but it'll be kind of cool to see how we match up early in the season with them. But... Um, long, long, long NBA season. Um, yeah, Christmas Day, kicking off Christmas Day, at least, you know, NBA-wise, the first game of the day, in New York at the Garden against the Knicks. How's that make you feel? I like it. I just really like the Sixers getting a Christmas Day game. I think, again, 
Troy mentioned it just now. They haven't had one since 2019 against the Bucks, which <clears throat> was a great game. So right. I'm hoping that it's going to be maybe not as great because of the Bucks obviously being better than the Knicks, but still being a great <laughs> game. And I'm I'm just really excited to see the the Sixers on Christmas. I was about to say the Christmas on Sixers, definitely not that. But I was, <laughs> but I'm definitely excited to see the Sixers on Christmas again because it's been three years. 2019 was the last time, and we're going on Christmas 2022. So it's been a while. It's been a long time in the making. So extremely excited. I know it's the Knicks. They're not the best competition, but I still would rather see Sixers on Christmas. Right then not see that so yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it'll be cool and 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 at at the garden so that's really really cool as well and so yeah look forward to that one um i'm not the biggest guy like when the schedule released i wasn't like looking at oh you know win yeah, loss win win, win loss There's loss 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 right and so but the one thing i did see and it wasn't me it was someone tweeted like oh my goodness did you see how the sixers end the season and so i'm gonna read <laughs> read these to you guys uh, listening, and um, I was like, "Wow, that that doesn't sound like a fun way to end the year." A lot of away games and against a lot of tough teams. So versus Chicago at home, and then Chicago on the road on the road <laughs> on the road at Golden State, at Phoenix, at Denver, at home against Dallas and Toronto, at Milwaukee, at home against Boston and Miami, at Atlanta, and at Brooklyn. Those are some quality basketball teams the Sixers end the year wow. with from you know the end of March into April. So, um, yeah, wow is right. Now, again, those are the last games of the year we're going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like you know, as far as the podcast, you know, we'll t- that's the f- first time till the end of March that we'll address that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's just kind of interesting to see how they end their season. But uh, that's a long way from now but you know it does get you thinking like if you're talking about you know at least the first thought that came to my mind you're talking about the Sixers positioning for seeding and if they're like really really close with Boston Milwaukee Miami whoever um you know when those games come then who knows what could happen they might fall to the bottom just based on how how the season (laughs) ends so yeah anyway that's again someone else pointed that out on Twitter and I was like that is it's, tough because yeah. what all of those teams are were playoff teams all of those teams were yeah um, right that you just mentioned yeah. yeah yeah so not fun <laughs> uh, anyway so let's briefly address Mr. Kevin Durant okay um, we talked about it a little bit last episode. I feel like we... He and James Harden are boys again, hanging out. Um, the rumors just continue. There's there's stuff every day. Now he allegedly wants to play with the Sixers and James Harden. Is that a thing? Do we believe that? I, I don't really believe anything anymore, honestly. There's just <laughs> so much that it's like, is this true? Is this actually happening? But it's like... He, I don't even know, like, has he actually said he wants to play for the Sixers? Now, is it him or is it people around him? Because you hear, like, right. oh, Kevin Durant's camp wants this. Or, like, oh, uh, LeBron James' camp wants this. Well, what does Kevin Durant want? Obviously, there's people around right. him that kind of help him, help guide him. But what does he actually want? Because, ultimately, it's he's going to be playing for that team. So he's gonna right. want to. He's gonna need. He's gonna want to need to go there. I'm sorry. He's going to need to want to go there. <laughs> right. But what baffles me about the whole thing is like. It. He's not a free right. agent. Right. Either. And so it's like. You know, if if there were, were there was a rumor that says Kevin Durant, free agent Kevin Durant, wants to go to the Seventy Sixers, that's a different yeah. thing from. As you mentioned, guys in his camp, you know, are hoping he gets traded to the 76ers. That's very, very different. And um, so I know you don't, you know, you're not putting a ton of stock in it. I'm not putting a ton of stock in it. Um, it's certainly not one that we're like certainly one I'm not monitoring as closely as it was with like James Harden. Um, and part of that is because even though it's the same two teams involved, the Sixers were the m- more maybe not more urgent need to get rid of. 
number 25, but it was like the longer period of time. Yeah, I think you know what I, I mean? see what you're saying when you're talking <laughs> about the urgency aspect because even though they the Sixers obviously weren't in a hurry to do it, they definitely wanted it to get done. Whereas with the Nets, right. I think it's qu- quite the opposite. I They're right. not in a hurry at all, but they also aren't in a rush to get it done because they've kind of made it clear, like, we want what we want. If Kevin Durant isn't traded, then, oh well, we're going to get what we want, and that's it. And they've, they've really stood by that, by what they've apparently been asking for the past few months so i believe i believe it yeah yep and um again we've talked about it like this would be a whoever if if kevin durant ends up on another team it's going to be a massive package uh, to get him because he's kevin (laughs) durant um so (laughs) we're just throwing that out there but also uh i saw something on your your you know trust the love instagram um talking about tyrese maxey um and kevin durant Um, i think you made a poll and um addressed i don't know what the question you phrased it as you can help me out but like it was basically would you include maxey for durant or something like that um or who would you rather have or something like that and the percentage was much higher to say keep maxey in in the voting and so you don't necessarily have to address yeah. your opinion or your thought on that, but like, I want your thoughts on what that shows about Maxi and the Sixers fans' love for him, or you know, help me out with all that, and even your your take on the percentage of the vote that was swayed in his well, way. Well, to be honest, the percentage of that poll really not really shocked me, but it definitely shocked me because I wasn't expecting that me that many people that amount of people mm-hmm. to actually decide against getting rid of Maxi in a trade. Um, I right. obviously there is a there's a decent percentage of Sixers fans I'd rather have him on the roster, which is fine. Like I said, I think I said it on my story as well. That's totally understandable, it's totally reasonable. And I underst- and again, I understand where they're coming from because it's Tyrese Maxi, he has a lot of potential right. and there's really no telling what he could be. We can probably make some guesses if we'd like to, but there really isn't any indication of, oh, well, he's going to be this kind of player. He's going to be that kind of player. And that's where the allure comes from. Why would we trade a guy who mm. who doesn't have a ceiling right now? You don't get a lot of players like that, let alone draft them. So I can see that, and like I said, it it it's it would it would make sense to me if someone says, no, I don't want to trade Tyrese Maxey for Kevin Durant. I mean, personally, mm-hmm. I would. Because it's okay. Kevin Durant, I love <laughs> Tyrese Maxey. I have a poster of him on my wall. You can't see it right now. I love Tyrese Maxey. But it's but Kevin we're trying Durant. to win a championship here. And I'm not saying Tyrese Maxey can't be an integral part of a championship winning team. He can be. Right. But we're talking about winning right now. Obviously, right. it would hurt a lot because of what I just talked about a few minutes ago. But it's Kevin Durant. It's Kevin Durant, and yeah. and it's just like you you I, you you just can't pass up the opportunity of pairing <laughs> three of the greatest scorers of all time. I don't care. I yeah. just I just don't care. Selfishly, I don't care. The Sixers need to do it. I know it's crossed Aaron Moore's mind. I just know. I'm not a part of the Sixers front office at all in any shape or form, but I know it's <laughs> crossed Aaron Moore's mind. So it's you yeah. you you can't pass up that chance. If that happen if there's an opportunity to get that done, you cannot pass that up. You can't. Hmm. Okay. I a lot more than I <laughs> thought I was going to. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so much for brief on Kevin Durant, but hey, uh Mr. Trust the Love is uh He's on it. so And I do not disagree with you. The thing, and, and I just, everyone does. I wish we had a crystal ball that would yes. say, make things okay, so if easier. the Sixers make the trade, they're going to win a championship, or at least they're going to get to the finals. If we knew that, it's like, okay, yes, let's yeah. do it. But it's also, if you go, if you turn Durant and he gets hurt, and it's just, there's two sides. Know, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's a higher risk thing 
I guess. But obviously the reward is, is great too. The potential reward, I should say, is there. And so that's why there's a there's a conflict. I here mean, we'd be of, talking do about we don't we? one of the best teams ever. So yeah. I, I'm not that's not an exaggeration, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not joking. Right. Right. So, I mean it's and I and I'm I'm someone who gets attached to Sixers players, you know what I mean? And it's like you know, it, it, even if it was a no-brainer trade, it would still be, it would still suck to see Tyrese go because you just love him. And he's a fan favorite. He's just so fun to watch, and he's just you know he's a great guy off the court, and all this stuff. Um, you know, but it, it would, a crystal ball would make this so much easier if we knew that you know Tyrese Maxey, you know, by the time he's thirty, is going to be a four or five, six-time All Star, and and do this and do that and do you know, um, it would make it a lot easier. But we just don't know. Um, and Kevin Durant's not getting younger. Um, he had obviously a shaky playoff against the playoff series against the Celtics last year, but he's still Kevin Durant, and that's not what's going to define him ultimately. And um, yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> I know. I mean, even on the outline, I put a little yawn emoji under yes. the KD wow, rumors did. as they continue, um, just because it it just it continues and continues, and we'll see what happens. But um, I mean, can you just imagine that guy in a seventy six <laughs> uniform? Like what? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, I thought James Harden was something, but Kevin Durant. Like, wow. Okay. Anywho, so like I said earlier, we um, or you had the you had the great idea to kind of break down some players in the in the dog days of the off season and just talk about what the Sixers have on the roster. And so we started with Daniel House and um, the Anthony Melton last episode and kind of just broke down where they've been in their careers, what they're gonna bring to the table. So we're going to do that quickly with, with three more guys, two of which have been on the Sixers roster, um, and then P.J. Tucker, and so the other two are George Niang and Matisse Thibault. We'll start with the last return or last new guy coming in, um, P.J. Tucker. So I'll give a few things on him, and then um, I'll kick it your way. But P.J. Tucker, 37 years old, um, NBA veteran to say the least, um, it's interesting because he, he came into the league at 21 uh, with Toronto, played 17 games, and then went overseas and did not touch an NBA floor again until 27 um, with his run with Phoenix, where he kind of became a, you know, at least the guy that he is now. Like, he kind of became a name. Um, if you look at his numbers, they haven't really changed drastically um, because, you know, he's, he's a 7, 8, 9 point a game guy. He's a 6, 7, 8 rebound a game guy, but. Um, his impact, as any NBA fan knows, goes beyond the stat sheet, and um, I, you and myself are uh, excited to see what he can bring to the table. Most recently, of course, um, spent a little bit of time in Milwaukee, helped them bring a ring in, and then uh, last year played in 71 games, started 70, which I don't think I realized, um, started 70 for the Miami Heat. Um, so he was a big part of that team, a, a good team. And so, yeah, what, what's your thoughts on, on PJ um, and what he can bring for us? Very, very excited to see PJ Tucker play for this team. One of the guys that I've, that I've been pushing for the Sixers to get probably since, like, May. Yeah. And we've been doing it here on Planet 76. We, we've been on that train, so... If you if you missed it, that's on you. But P.J. Tucker, career 36% three-point shooter. Um, is that three-point shooter? Yeah, that is three-point shooter. On nearly three attempts per game, which volume-wise isn't that great, but efficiency-wise that's pretty good, 36%. Career years from three in Houston, might I add, we're seeing a lot of similarities between guys who have played with James Harden. Daniel House, in our last episode we talked about, had career years, career years with Harden. P.J. Tucker also having career years with Harden in terms of three-point percentage, it seems. Or that's, is that field goal percentage or is that three-point percentage? No, that's... Well, in terms of in terms of volume, he, took, he shot the most threes when he was with James Harden. I don't think that's a coincidence either. And, and he also had some of his career years in scoring with the Rockets. He had his career year in Phoenix scoring-wise, 9.4 points per game. But last year with the Heat, he also averaged nearly 8 a game, which he didn't 
even come close to getting until or he, the last time he got close to that was in 2019 with Houston again with James Harden. Obviously, we're seeing some learnings here. Um, so I'm just again, just like Daniel House, I'm excited to see what these guys can still be while playing alongside James Harden, one of the greatest offensive players of this generation of all time, there is a lot to be seen from this guy. Even though he's a little older, a little on the older side, I'm not convinced that he can't give you what he's giving you uh, last year. In, even in Milwaukee, even though he scored less, he was still really good defensively. I'm, I'm not convinced that he still can't give you something something close to that, something at least in the middle of that, with still really good defense, and he's he spaces the floor, which is exactly what the Sixers need. Like we've been saying here, all, basically every episode, floor spacing, guys who can shoot the ball, guys who can play off the ball alongside Harden and Embiid. Like, P.J. Tucker is still that kind of guy. Even if he's not going to give you the points, he's still going to be the guy to shoot the threes, to space the floor, to help with things like that, the, the little things, really, that that are important to the makeup of championship teams, which, again, he's been a part of one, so it helps a lot. Yeah, I'm excited. He, um, even just now, I picked up on something that is encouraging. So not only did he start 70 games for a very good Miami Heat team last year, um, but he also shot a career high percentage from three in any single season as well as from the field you know just three point and and from two uh inside the arc he he had a career high in, in percentage shooting so and that's at 36 years old and we, we touched we've touched on this you know way back when when we acquired pj tucker but like he has a game that obviously it doesn't matter how old he is unlike a lot of guys who have a prime from you know, 25 to 32 or whatever you want to say, and then they kind of fall off. Like, no, this is a guy who at 36, after many, many years in the NBA, um, did something he hadn't done before, and he shot over 41% from three. And uh, he's going to continue to do the little things. He's going to continue to do things that affect winning. Um, I mean, we saw it in game six against the Sixers and how he would come up with a clutch offensive rebound, how he would just do something big that goes beyond the stat sheet um, he would get out and defend a guard. He would get out and in in transition he, and, and knock down a corner three. He would get, you know, down low and, and, and swat the ball out of bounds and get a steal and get a block and just bring energy. And this is a 37-year-old man. So um, that's going to continue. You know what I mean? I don't think he's going to fall off. He's obviously durable. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm excited. And I think, again, as you mentioned, playing alongside James Harden, um, those those attempts from three per game are going to probably go up slightly, and I'm okay with that. You know why I'm okay with that? Because he shot 41 percent from three last he's year. So um, he's automatically going to be yeah. one of the Sixers' best shooters on the on the roster already, and he hasn't played yet. He already is that because of what he brings you. Right, right, all right. So exciting stuff there. Um, let's transition to two guys that have been here. One guy for one year, and then one for, gosh, what's it going to be? Matisse's fourth season. I think so, yeah. Do you want to do Niang first or Thibault? We can start with Niang. So, let's go there. So George Niang, um, first year for the Sixers. Um, I know you were a big fan of George and what he did this year for Philly. Um, how do you see him? We can get into you know some of the overall stuff after you answer this, but how do you see him fitting to this new look Sixers with some more bench depth and you know is he a lock for one of those main roles off the bench? Um, talk about that. Yeah, I think he's. I think his role is going to remain relatively the same. I think if anything, it's probably going to take some pressure off of him because this past season, I think a lot of fans and the, the team I guess as a whole were kind of reliant on him to be a be the main difference maker off the bench and I'm not saying he isn't but I think bringing in other guys who can create a lot of offense for themselves guys like Milton occasionally house 
I think that's going to take a lot of pressure off of him because he is a great three-point shooter. And unfortunately, that's all he is. He's not really an offensive creator guy. He's not going to really get you his own shot. He's a he's a fantastic three-point shooter, catch and shoot three-point shooter. And he excels at that. And he should he sh- that's what his role should be and for the most part is. And it needs to stay that way. So I think his role is going to be that. He, it's going to be just that. It's going to remain relatively the same minute-wise. You know, depending on how he plays, he could see some Maybe a couple minutes taken, but he's really the only Sixers backup forward who can who is who is truly a forward. Like we talked about last episode, House can maybe play the three or four, but I wouldn't go four because he's six six. Um, he's you know I don't really know how he's gonna be how he's be able gonna be able to translate to that kind of role. But I'd I'd much rather have Niang at the backup four really, which I think is perfect for him. So I think he's gonna be. I think he's gonna have relatively the same role, honestly. Yeah, I I, uh, I completely agree, and I completely agree even with you mentioning, you know, depending on how he plays, he could just because yeah. the bench got yeah. better, and if a bench gets better and you're not playing, you know, as well as you could, you might see just a couple minutes taken. But he he is solid, I think, in that position, the backup four. And uh, even looking at, you know, just his numbers, so he's going to be entering his seventh NBA season, and last year in his 60s, sixth season, his first with the Sixers, career high in minutes, and it's not even close, he was up near 23 minutes a game uh, across 76 games for the Sixers, um, over nine points a game, he had a career high, so career high in points, career high in minutes, career high in field goal attempts, um, which is big, and you mentioned, you know, he's a he's a knockdown three point shooter. He's really evolved into that in his time in the NBA. He's you know around forty percent, uh, over forty percent this season as well. Um, so you know, in, coming from someone who, you know, I watched a lot of George Niang back in the day, uh, back in college during his Iowa State days, and his game has completely evolved since then. So at Iowa State, he was a guy who even at six seven had the ball in his hands like a lot yeah. like like often and you know he would make plays he would finish around the rim and we see glimpses of that um in philadelphia but you know nothing like it was back then and props to him for being able to evolve and change his game and make a career um out of it in the nba so entering his seventh season with the sixers uh look for more of the same from george Niang. all right Last but not least, for tonight's episode, episode 62, let's talk about Mr. Mr. Matisse Steibel. Jinx. Take it away. Mr. Matisse Steibel. So first things first, let me get some stats up for you real quick because I think I think when you talk about Matisse Steibel, I think it's kind of important to really like understand. And I'm not like... Why isn't it working? I'm not trying to like... I guess... What's the word I'm looking for? Like overblow it, I guess. But hold on, I can't. I can't get his stats up. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so Matisse Thybul with the Sixers, obviously for his career, five points per game, forty-five percent from the field, thirty-two percent from three, which that's pretty. I mean, league average field goal percentage, I think, is like forty-six, forty-seven, maybe. Actually, it might be a little too high. But you got average three point percentage is thirty five percent. Now something interesting that I that I really want everyone to take notice of, and it's strange because you would think it would be the opposite, but he shot the highest percentage from three in his rookie season on the most attempts per game, thirty six percent on two and a half attempts nearly per game. But he averaged a career high almost six points this year per game with. Basically, the well, twenty six minutes nearly. So it's Thibault's one of those players career high in steals as well, which I actually did not know that. Um, career high in rebounds too. Wow. Uh, Thibault's one of those guys. You're just you. Uh, it's it's hard to like if you. It it's is hard. hard. To explain, like, <laughs> he's a player that ideally you would want on your roster. He's the kind of player that you would think, wow, this guy's an amazing defender. 
what else does he give you? Well, that's where the question marks come in because offensively, he leaves a lot to be desired, especially from a player, especially from a player like that. He's six foot seven, athletic wing. You would like to think that he becomes a better three point shooter. You would like to think he becomes a better scorer in general. You'd like to think that he becomes a better shot creator. Because of those tools, we see guys today in the NBA, they have all the, they have his height, they have his athleticism, they have all these tools, and they eventually go into that role. Um, the traditional 3 and D player. That's ideally what you'd like Thibodeau to be because he, he fits the model. He it, he basically is the model. Six foot seven, can guard multiple positions, just unfortunately is not a great three-point shooter. Not only on... Not only on really, not only on not really great volume, but not really great percentage either. Again, career two point three attempts on thirty two percent shooting from three. So that's if he can really hone in on the three ball, and it doesn't even have to be the three ball really, because if he just develops some sort of like self creation, yeah, some sort of self creation ability, whether it's a dribble drive game, whether it's a slashing game. Well, sure, yeah, but what I'm saying is like a, a, a sort of an, a development in, okay, give Matisse the ball, let's see what he can do. That's what I personally would like to see because, th- you know, three-point shooting is great and all, but he may never be a great three-point shooter. But what he could be a lot better at is his dribble drive game because he's quick, he's explosive, he's athletic, as we're talking about. He could be a guy that could put the ball on the floor you know, attack the rim and get you some points in the paint or get to the line. He could be that kind of guy offensively. And if that's all he is offensively, that's fine. Because he's he's no longer he's no longer a limiting factor offensively. He's giving you something offensively to go along with his defense. So it's like, okay, Matisse Thibault is a great defender. Well he can also get his own shot occasionally. That kind of thing. It's tough. He, he's a tough one, you know, because I it's think puzzling. it is puzzling. And I think this year, more than his first two seasons, his first year and, you know, the sophomore year campaign that he put out, this year yeah. in particular, there's been a growing frustration extremely... in Sixers land on social media or just you, know, you talk to Sixers fans. It's frustrating because the offensive game hasn't improved. You mentioned he shot 35.7% from three in his rookie season, which is league average, if not a little bit better. Yeah, basically league average. Um, and that was like, that was the best we ever felt about Matisse. Obviously, it was still the defense, but the fact that he was around 35%, I think we were happy with that. And it's amazing how, it's it baffles me how, you know, between 35% and 31%, like, is that a huge difference? Not really, but like in the NBA from three point, it is is viewed as a huge difference. And so, you know, I think if he could just, because obviously if he's done it, he can do that again. If he gets up to that on, you know, a, you know, maybe a little bit more volume from three, maybe around three attempts per game. Um, I think you, I think you take that. Um, because then there's going to be much less chatter about how much of a liability he is on offense because he's knocking it down 35 36% of the time. Um, and I think he can get there. Do I think he's going to jump from 31 to 40%? No. Um, but I think he can, he, can, he can jump up a little bit. And, you know, he hasn't improved on the offensive game in his NBA career through three seasons. Um, the one, I guess, bright spot, and this might be due to some of what we've already talked about, talked about on just giving it, getting him involved in situations where, um, you know, it's not just from three, but he can just make some sort of impact on offense, is that he was at 50% from the field um, in this third season, which was much higher than his first two seasons, where he was around 42%. Um, so that was one encouraging thing, but that's also one thing that I'd be lying if I told you I knew that before looking at this right now. <laughs> Um, so to do with that what you will, but he was around 25 minutes per game, um, this year, but that could change. He, he could get fewer minutes this year again, due to this bolstered bench unit that the Sixers have. I mean, he started 50 games this year of the 66 games that he played and we don't see him starting this year. 
right? I mean, given what the Sixers lineup looks like, if P.J. Tucker's in the lineup, I then guess so. who's not starting? Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Right. But it's possible. So, yeah. I mean, he'll, he'll get some, but, I, you know, I, I'd i imagine that just like the Miami Heat did, P.J. Tucker's going to be in the starting lineup, along with Tobias and Bede, Harden, and, and Tyrese Maxey. Like, so, um, it's interesting, he's man. He's player in the sense of, like, <laughs> You and and to the to the psychology point, I guess, of Matisse Thybulle, it's like as Sixers fans, we're thinking, "Wow, this dude has everything you need from an NBA player." Why doesn't he have offense of any in any capacity? Like, obviously, offense is more than just scoring, but he doesn't really give you anything. He's a great cutter off the ball. And he's, like, he can give you some, you know, scoring a little bit occasionally. But it's like, there's just so much that you want him to be because he can be that. If there wasn't any glimpse of anything or any, if he didn't have the tools or anything like that, nobody would be saying, oh, Matisse, he can be this, he can be that. But we see it. We see that he can be that. So you're, you're, you're just... You, you just think it's going to happen. Like, it's something that you are just really looking forward to. Yeah. Well, we've seen so many guys in the NBA make a transition or make a change to their game where they improve. We just talked about one in George yeah. Niang, who in college was a different player than he is now. Think about, like, Brooke Lopez. I forget the stat, but he attempted, like, two threes in his first three seasons in the NBA. Now he attempts three a game or, you know, something, like, crazy like that. Um, we've seen guys make jumps, and for Matisse, because he's so good on defense, like, you know, my goal for him is to get to league average from three, and then it's all forgotten. It would only it's all take like, a minuscule offensive yeah. improvement from him to just right. absolutely catapult him as a player. He yes. would just take leaps as a player if he improves some one aspect, just consistently right. improving that. Right. That's for sure. Anyway. That is our player profiles for P.J. Tucker, Woo! George Niang, Matisse Thibel. Uh There will be more coming on episode 63. And uh, we will see you next time on Planet 76. Have a good day, a good night whenever you're listening to this. Tell your friends, subscribe, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time on Planet 76. Peace. Are you on Instagram? Why don't you go give us a follow at Planet 76 Podcast so you can be in the know when we drop new episodes. Thanks for listening to this one, and we'll see you next time.